Well, I guess I should have realized something was wrong. We were simply too happily married. Everything was going too well. My wife was always attentive, and I always tried to respond in kind. I was as faithful as an old dog, and I believed she was the same. Of course we had our arguments. Show me a couple that doesn't fight from time to time, and together we will see a couple without passion. All married couples argue and fight. If we hadn't argued, I would have thought that she didn't care, but the arguments always ended in some kind of mutual reconciliation. One of us exploded. We argued, let it out, and then made up. I think some time ago, if I think back it was maybe six months ago, our family life started to change in a different direction. What can I say about this? Well, it all started with a phone call I received in 2013. I remember him well. It was Friday, September 6th, a little after 2000 p.m., the first week after Labor Day. Labor Day went well. We invited the family, her brother with his wife and children, and my two sisters with their families. We had a traditional barbecue. The ladies drank wine, we men drank beer, and the children all swam in the pool. The rest of the week was the usual back-to-work nonsense. MRS Barbara went back to her job and I went back to mine. Barbara was 37, about 5'6 tall, and weighed about 130 pounds. With brown hair and blue eyes, she was the typical too attractive woman who spent too much time and money on clothes and other frivolities. She said her job required it, but regular teeth whitening, massages, skin scrubs, or whatever they call it, plus trips to the salon twice a month always seemed unnecessary to me. Barbara earned a bachelor's degree in business from a local college and got a job and worked her way up to assistant director of public relations for a mid-sized consulting firm outside Washington. I was 38, just under six feet tall, and weighed about 190 pounds. I have brown hair and brown eyes. Barbara and I met in college, fell in love, etc. I am the deputy head of the accounting department in a large corporation that specializes in lobbying the interests of various charitable organizations. We lived in a nice house in a medium-sized town about 30 miles northeast of Washington. Along the way, we had two children. Derek, the eldest, was a senior in high school, and Elaine, the youngest, was in junior high. They both went to the same school, but Elaine wanted her own car since she had recently gotten her license. I was going to make sure she got it. Now for the real nonsense. I've done my week. Barbara did her part. As I said, I received a phone call around 2 as in p.m. on Friday. It was one of Barbara's assistants. I didn't know, but one of her colleagues was retiring, and they were throwing him a small party at one of the bars near their office. The assistant told me about the event and added that I needed to be there. I almost never went to events hosted by Barbara's people, and apparently over the years she stopped inviting me. But that was not the case. Hank Chenoweth was retiring. He was a longtime friend, and until he fell and broke his hip a few years ago, we regularly fished together on the Potomac. Don't be confused. He's older, the hip was a sign of more serious problems, and he's pretty much stopped doing any physical activity since then. We were real friends. I visited him at home. I would go to his retirement party. The assistant said that the meeting was in a place called Moore. They have reserved a private section and that everyone, employees and their spouses, is invited. She also added that gifts are welcome. I knew I had to go. I asked her if my wife asked her to call me. The assistant replied that no, but that she and her colleagues saw fit to tell me. Curious, I asked why. She said I just had to be there. Her comment really piqued my curiosity. I'm not a suspicious person. I loved my wife with all my heart and would have done anything for her but her not telling me about the appointment for Mr. Chenoweth was pointless. Forgot? I didn't think she would forget something like that, and why did the low-level assistant feel the need of her own volition to call and tell me? Something didn't add up. I needed to go. School ended at 2.30 p.m., and by the time I cleared out my desk and got ready, I was able to text my kids. I wrote to both of them, but thought only Elaine would respond saying she wanted to suck up to her old man about the car and all that. I left the office and headed to Moore. With Friday traffic, it was about a 40-minute drive. 
On the way, I received a message from Elaine. I answered and asked if she had heard anything from Mom. Elaine answered and noted that Mom had left a note that she would be working late, sorting out something that needed to be done before the weekend, and that we would be on our own for dinner. She said she would be home around 8. I texted Elaine and told her to take what she wanted, but to stay home in case she needed me. She replied that she did not want to stay at home. I answered with one word car. She replied that she would stay by the phone. I thought, that's my girl. Now Barbara's reminder about dinner, combined with work, plus the retirement party, really piqued my curiosity. I needed to get to Pestilence. I pulled into the parking lot. I suspected that this place usually gets busy late on a Friday night. I was not mistaken. I had to park at a distance. This gave me a chance to look around the parking lot. I looked around but didn't see my wife's car, so I assumed she did work late. I opened my phone and called her at work. I received a standard voicemail saying the office was closed. It will open on Monday, but you can leave a message. As I walked to the front door, I thought things were getting more interesting. I walked in, found an employee, and asked where the retirement party was. He led me into the room. I walked in and saw almost everyone from her office. The place was pretty packed. I didn't see my wife anywhere. I thought she might have been there if she had gone with someone, but I didn't see her, not a trace. I knew a few of my wife's co-workers, so I headed over to them when I saw one of them. I asked everyone if they had seen my wife. I received different answers. Some said she had to skip because she had to get home. One even said that she said we had plans with her. I found a young girl who called me and asked her if she had seen my wife. She replied that no, and that she did not expect to see her. I asked her then why she bothered to call me. She said she didn't want to get in trouble, but that I should ask if Mr. Buzz's Woodland, a Mr. Matthew, Matt Woodland, was at the party. The young woman looked scared. I thanked her and walked away. I didn't want to show it, but her words froze my guts and a stone began to form in my stomach. A few years ago, I had a similar feeling when my son was on a school trip and the bus went into a ditch. Several children were injured, but no one knew which children were injured for quite some time. This terrible feeling of uncertainty. I felt like this now. I thought maybe they were driving together and got into an accident. I held on. I found Hank Chenoweth. I wished him all the best and promised to buy him a gift. He asked for a new rod and reel. I said I would remember this and promised that we would meet soon. He smiled one of those smiles when you realize that this is not here and not now, but in another life. At that moment I realized that he was in bad condition. I shook his hand, squeezed it tightly, apologized to my wife and left. It was weird, not funny, but weird the way Hank looked at me. He knew something, and it had nothing to do with his health. I needed to go home. I arrived home a little after seven in the evening. Derek left, but Elaine was home. I asked her, have you heard anything from mom? Elaine was fiddling with her phone. She looked up, what? I repeated, have you heard anything from mom? No, she answered, without looking up, not since she left. I was not an expert in new technologies. I knew how to send messages. We had GPS systems in our cars. I was pretty computer savvy, but the intricacies of texting were a little beyond my understanding, and it just occurred to me that I needed to catch up. Elaine, you're good with phones, right? She quickly looked at me suspiciously. Why do you ask? Just wondering, I replied. Is it possible to retrieve messages from someone else's phone? She stopped what she was doing. You don't trust me. No. I replied, I trust you. Just wondering if, say, I wanted to see what's on someone else's phone. Whose phone? She asked. Not yours. Not Derek. He doesn't do anything anyway. I shook off the thought of Barbara and grinned. And you? No, of course not. I'm not stupid. I know what can happen. I returned to my original question. Can I? Of course it's easy. Do you know how? Elaine put down the phone. Who do you want to check, Mom? I smiled. Maybe. Elaine grinned. 
Sure, I can show you. You can even download what she writes to your own phone. Elaine, I said, I want you to show me, but you don't have to tell Mom. That's mean, Dad. I laughed. Yes, that's true, really. You won't tell anyone? You know me, Dad. I'm your girl, but I'm going to need my mom's phone for a few minutes if you don't have any information about her phone. I sat down and turned on the TV. I'll get her phone for you. You can set it up tonight and show it to me tomorrow while we close up the pool. Dad, I chuckled. We'll finish the pool early, then we can look at the cars. She smiled. I like it. She stood up and walked towards her room, but quickly turned around. I love you, Dad. I smiled back. I know, honey. She headed up the stairs. I went into the kitchen, made myself a ham sandwich, and grabbed a soda. I threw some chips on a paper plate and went into the living room to watch TV and wait for Barbara. I sat and watched nothing. There was nothing to see there. I thought about Barbara, about our life together, why she would lie about something as trivial as a retirement meeting. I was wondering who Matt Woodland was. I was wondering why my wife made up a story about work. Was there something wrong? I didn't know and honestly didn't think I needed to find out. Whatever it was, I was sure there was a perfectly reasonable explanation. I kept thinking about the grinding sound I heard last night when Barbara turned her wheels. She must have hit something. I'll need to look under the right tire. Barbara returned home a little after nine in the evening. I saw her car drive into the entrance, heard her get out and enter. Given the location of our house, you could walk in and go straight upstairs or turn right and go into the living room. Barbara walked in and immediately headed towards the stairs. She saw me, sighed and said, I'm tired and I feel dirty. I want to get away. I'll be back in a minute. I smiled. Rough day? She started up the steps, stopped, nodded and said, Yeah. I asked, Have you done all the work? She took another step, stopped, smiled weakly, raised her hand and moved her fingers, saying, To the last drop. I said, why don't you lie in the bath for a while, change into something cozy, and just go to bed? I have a lot to do before bed. We can talk in the morning. She looked relieved, but then if I had worked as long as she had, I would have looked like that too. She replied, I think I will. She began to climb the steps. Somewhere on the top step, I heard her phone ring as a message arrived. I think she stopped for a minute, but I'm not sure. I returned to the TV. Somewhere around 11, I fell asleep on the sofa. I got up and went upstairs. Barbara was already asleep. I quietly took out her phone and walked down the corridor. I knocked on Elaine's door. From inside, Elaine screamed, Who is it? I'm not dressed. I whispered back, This is your dad. I have my mom's number. Elaine walked to the door, opened it, and let me in. She was only wearing a bra and panties, but I'm a dad, and that didn't count. As we approached her desk, she asked me, You think Mom is spending money again, right? I was behind her, so I didn't see her face, but I heard concern. Barbara has racked up debt in the past. I reassured her, I don't think so. I just want to be able to keep track of everything. I knew it didn't sound very convincing, but Barbara had several shopping cards, and... Well, some of her friends. I was surprised. With Barbara's phone and mine in hand, Elaine finished everything in less than a minute. She said, Sorry, Dad, but the way I set it up, until you get to your laptop, you'll have to use mine. I didn't think much of it. Of course, honey. See you in the morning. When I left her room, she reminded me, Don't forget, cars are tomorrow. I said, I won't forget. I went to our bedroom, Barbara's and mine, took off my clothes, changed my panties, and went to bed. Barbara was already asleep. I lay on my back, hands behind my head, and thought, Is Barbara really something? Did you do it? Why didn't she tell me about Hank's pension? Why did she come up with a story about work? Who is Matt Woodland? Oh yeah, Sunday is rally day at our church, and she chairs the worship committee. She probably printed and prepared the ballots. It explains everything. However, 
I tried to go back and remember what we did during the summer. Isn't that what men like me always do? I couldn't remember anything. Barbara was as warm and caring as always. Our nightly pleasures were just as pleasant and comforting. She was not more or less critical. I didn't feel forgotten. Of course, she stayed late at work a couple of times. She was leaving for a seminar in August. It was a little unusual. For my birthday in July, we had a small party. She spent the night at her mother's one night. Mom is a widow, so it's normal. She took a couple of days off from work to do things around the house. I honestly didn't see much done, but it didn't mean anything. There were a few times I called her at work, and she was unavailable. But she always had a perfectly reasonable explanation when I asked. No, there was nothing, not a single reason to doubt her. She was my girl, and I loved her. Eighteen years of marriage and two before that without the slightest doubt. However, who is this Matt Woodland, and why did the young assistant mention him? I decided not to bother Barbara. She was a good mom, a great wife, a saint to her mother, and worked hard, and my questions would sound like suspicions and discontent. I didn't want her to think I didn't trust her, because I did. I loved my wife. I believed in her. She would never do anything. I turned on my side to go to sleep. But sleep never came. Saturday morning came, Elaine and I closed the pool, and then went looking at used cars. I already had a couple of options in mind. We stopped at a Cadillac dealership. They had a pretty decent Kia on their used car lot. Sorry, there are previously owned cars on their lot. Elaine and I checked on her. It drove well, had a cool five-speed transmission, and just over 30,000 miles on the odometer. I spoke to the seller, an older gentleman, a very nice man. I told him that my daughter and I were going to go out and get something to eat, talk things over, and be back in an hour or so. A very nice older gentleman told me that this particular car probably wouldn't be here when we returned. I asked him why, and he said his boss had already reserved it for his daughter. They'll probably take her while we're gone. I listened, thanked him, and told him that his boss should take it for his daughter since we probably wouldn't be coming back. A nice gentleman told me he could keep it if I paid a small deposit. I thanked him but declined. A few minutes later, Elaine and I were driving to the Toyota dealership when she asked me, Why didn't you buy the Kia, Dad? It's going to be sold now. His boss is going to buy it for his daughter. It must be a great deal. I gave her a fatherly smile. Honey, it was just an old fox trying to speed us up. That car will be there next week. He was lying. That nice old man, she said. Yes, I said, that nice old man. Elaine leaned back. God, it's impossible to trust anyone anymore. That's when I gave her one of my best fatherly smiles. Don't worry. You'll always have mommy and me. We'll never let you down. Besides, I have a Toyota in mind. We bought a Toyota. It had a little higher mileage and a scratch on the dash. The seller gave us a discount for the scratch, and we took it. I called my insurance agent, gave him the information, and he took out insurance on the car. I followed Elaine home while she drove her new car. When we returned, we showed it to Barbara and Derek. Derek was a little annoyed because her car was newer than his Jeep. He also knew that she had received a more reliable car. He complained a little, but not too much. I knew why. His Jeep had a spacious rear compartment. Of course, I never mentioned this. Barbara saw the car and was delighted. We've already discussed this. I mentioned two cars and Barbara, based on my comments, had already said she preferred the Toyota. Barbara is quite smart. A little later, Elaine took my phone. She said she wanted to do something fun with him. She winked at me. I knew she was going to make it so Barbara's text messages could be seen. I thought I'd never bother with it, but it gave Elaine something to do. Barbara prepared a light dinner, some seafood salad and some curly fries. We all ate in silence. Derek had plans. Elaine spent most of her time texting. At the end of dinner, Barbara received a message and walked away for a minute. After dinner, I went out to make sure the pool was ready. A little later, Barbara and I were watching TV. She told me what she had been doing all day. Nothing special, some laundry and ironing a few things for Elaine. 
Elaine wanted to come out and show off her car. I warned her to be careful and be back before dark. She said she'll be back, and she really came back. Around 10.30 Barbara and I headed to bed. Tomorrow was Sunday. We are Methodists, and the first Sunday after Labor Day is Rally Day. We didn't expect the children to come with us, but we definitely did. Barbara has already prepared the casserole. I forgot about the ballots. Well, we went to bed and hugged each other. Barbara said she was tired. I was disappointed, but said I understood. We both kissed and turned to sleep. She received another message. She apologized and said it was probably a girl from work. She said that the girl was having problems with the program and might need help. I kissed Barbara as she stood up. She said she would call the girl on her home phone downstairs and walk her through the problem. I did not think about that. An hour later, I was still awake and Barbara still hadn't returned. Was I worried? No, not really. What was there to worry about? How many times have people from my office called me on a Saturday night with a problem? I couldn't remember a single incident. How many times has Barbara gotten a call with the same problem, knowing that no one in her office did anything but get drunk on a Friday night? Barbara returned a little later. I asked her if the problem had been resolved. She said she thought so, but she might have to check on the girl tomorrow after church. I asked her if she planned to call. Barbara said she would probably come herself. I said, okay. Well, it's Sunday. Church as church. Derek left. Elaine needed money to wash her car. Around two o'clock, Barbara left to check on the girl's problem. Barbara had a GPS in her car. I activated it and checked where she was from time to time. I didn't spy on her. I was just checking. I knew she didn't go to the office. She drove to a location on Kashmir Drive. I went online, did a satellite search, and saw a residential complex there. These global satellite images do not provide a live image education. It's usually something from a few months ago or more, so I couldn't see Barbara's car or anything like that. But I saw that it was quite a prestigious complex. I recorded this on my laptop. Barbara returned around 4 o'clock in the evening. She looked pretty fresh. Well, she took a shower this morning. Church was hardly hard work, and traveling several miles in an air-conditioned car was unlikely to cause sweat, so I had no reason to suspect anything was wrong, and I didn't suspect anything. Okay, I've read a little about this. There are probably a hundred websites dedicated to different aspects of marriage. Maybe I skimmed through them a little. So what? Barbara is back. I asked her, Did you go to the office? She replied, yes, there was a slight problem with access. The alarm system was on. Oh, I know the code. I just had to enter it. I said, really? Have you solved the girl's problem? Barbara said half laughing, you know those young girls. They panic about everything. I got it all sorted out. I smiled on the outside, but not on the inside, and said, well, I'm glad you did it. Barbara said, me too. Would you like to eat out tonight? I thought no. I didn't want to be near Barbara at that moment. But that's not what I said. I said, Olive Garden. She said, sounds great. Let's wait for the kids and we'll all go together. That's what we did. At the restaurant, Barbara received a text and wanted to leave because Elaine and I were discussing her car. I was starting to get a little worried. Elaine drove a little more than I would have liked. I told her, Elaine, you know this car is mainly for school. I don't want you driving around the neighborhood. I love this girl. Don't worry, Dad. I'll be careful. I warned, no texting or talking on the phone while driving. I looked at Derek. That goes for you too, kid. Derek just grinned and said, you're going to put a GPS in Elaine's car. I think you'll need it. This ruined my evening, but I didn't show it. I told him, you can rest assured. I smiled at Elaine, we'll install it tomorrow when I get home from work. She smiled, I'm all yours, Dad. Barbara is back, I asked. Problems at work again? She looked worried. No, it was Mom. I asked, is she okay? 
She continued to look at her salad plate. No, just lonely. We finished dinner. I drank some red wine. Barbara also drank a little. The children drank soda. We got into my Chevrolet. Barbara drove a BMW and drove home. Later that evening, when the kids were in their rooms, I tried to hug my wife. She refused, saying she had a headache and was worried about her mother. I thought, well, not once all weekend. Barbara turned off the light. The last thing she said before curling up on her pillow was that she would probably take the day off tomorrow. She didn't feel very well. I moved closer. I thought we would hug a little, but Barbara turned away further and apologized. I gave up. Monday will be busy for me. What's the old saying? Monday, Monday, don't trust the day. I got up early. Woke up Elaine and Derek. Barbara came down before I left, I asked. Are you feeling better? She sort of sighed, or maybe moaned. I'll be better. I think I just overate, or what I ate wasn't good for me. I said, okay. I kissed her forehead and went to work. My Monday mornings are usually pretty hectic. By the time I figured it out, it was almost 12 is in. I called John Huffman's office. John and I worked together on many projects, and we used to have lunch together. We agreed to meet downstairs and go to Luigi's, a small lunch restaurant popular with people like us. We went, ordered, and got down to business. I took the shrimp salad. John took the chef's salad. We ate and discussed the usual nonsense. John and I have been good friends and colleagues for a long time. Barbara and I used to invite him and his wife to dinner from time to time, but a little over a year ago things went south for the Huffmans. John's wife started an affair with a neighbor, left John and their children, and moved away. John had been going through a difficult time for quite some time. We discussed this when it all happened. His constant comment was that he never believed this could happen to him. But it happened. I felt sorry for him. He didn't deserve this. He worked hard. They had four children, all older than mine. She filed for divorce on the grounds of psychological abuse. We both lived in Maryland. He lived in Chevy Chase, Barbara, and I lived much further away. There is no such thing as a no-fault divorce in Maryland, at least not technically, and the term irreconcilable differences means nothing. In Maryland, an aggrieved spouse can get at their partner using infidelity, and the plaintiff doesn't even need visual or electronic evidence, they just have to prove the likelihood of misconduct. Understand what this means. John could have caught her, but he had children and didn't want to ruin their lives. Man, he took the hit himself. I was glad that I didn't have that problem. My marriage was on solid ground. John's life was completely different. Oh, he was dating someone, said he had affairs a few times, but it wasn't the same. He said 22 years was a long time. It's not so easy to just walk away, even if you're right. Like I said, I was glad my marriage was okay. After lunch, I returned to the office and thought about John. I thought about Barbara, too. I was thinking about Matthew Woodland. Oh, of course I was stupid. I knew it. Around 2 as p.m., I took a break. I decided to look for something. Now everyone in the country thinks of Maryland as the big blue state, and in some ways it is, but in other ways it's still very much the old South, straw suit, Panama hat, big cigar. Liberals and leftists have done a lot, but like everyone else, they haven't gotten it all. Schools and public companies were still expected to meet some fairly strict standards. I didn't know if it was a liberal thing, but I learned that most local companies and the state government were pretty strict about things like morality. It was just a joke, a stupid whim, but I checked Barbara's company policy. Oh yeah, her company had pretty strict policies about sexual harassment, workplace bullying, and something I'd never heard of called a hostile work environment. I was thinking about this guy, Matthew Woodland. Who is he? What if he's harassing my beautiful girlfriend? What if he's forcing her? Barbara is a good girl, a corporate girl. She would be scared to death to say anything about it. Of course, if this Woodland was some kind of big shot, if he was after my beautiful wife, I would have to fix him, yes, fix him well. I could imagine my sweet girl being afraid to move the boat. She might even be afraid to tell me. Of course she would be afraid to tell me, 
she knew that I would be up my ass in no time. I called Barbara's company and contacted someone I knew. This was a guy I'd known since Barbara started working there. He was one of the good people. I saw him at Hank's retirement. His name was Hugh Ballantyne. I got through to Hugh's secretary, told her who I was, and that I needed to talk to her boss. She connected me immediately. I spoke to Hugh. Hi, Hugh. This is Ryan Green, Barbara's husband. Yes, Ryan. We just talked on Friday. How was your weekend? Okay, I hope everything was good for you, too. Yes, everything was fine with me, too. How can I help? I started, You have a guy named Matthew Woodland. What can you say about him? Hugh jokes, You don't happen to work for the CIA, do you? No, I just want to know a little about him. Hugh began, Well, let's see, he's nobody really. He's 22 or 23, I think. Just out of college. He's doing small jobs for now, but some of the middle management have high hopes for him. Why are you asking? I asked, is he somehow related to my Barbara? No, answered Hugh. He's in another part of the forest. Did something happen? Well, Hugh, I think someone might be harassing my wife, and his name has come up. It became quiet on the other end of the line. It was a moment filled with anticipation. I wondered if I had caught a sexual predator. If so, I'll get that bastard. Finally, Hugh said something. You know, Ryan, I think I've seen them together a couple of times. Is there something you want me to say to HR? I leaned back. I caught the bastard. No, Hugh, don't worry. I can handle it myself. I leaned back further. Thank God I found the problem. The rest of the day passed easily. On the way home, I stopped and bought Barbara a dozen red roses and a bottle of her favorite perfume. She needed to be comforted, I was her husband, and that was my job. I returned home at the usual time. Barbara was in the kitchen. She didn't do anything, just sat at the table. I looked around and didn't see Elaine or Derek. Looking at Barbara, it looked like she was crying. I gave her flowers and perfume. I sat up. What's wrong, honey? She didn't look at me. She looked at the floor. The children. They ran away. I leaned back. What? They ran away. They left a note saying they won't come back until you come home. Elaine wants you to call her immediately. Damn it, I thought. What's gotten into them? I pulled out my cell phone and quickly pressed Elaine's number. He only called once before she answered. I was angry. Elaine, what's going on? You and your brother go home immediately. I heard Elaine cry, Oh, Dad. I was scared. Are you hurt? Is Derek okay? You didn't have an accident? I shuddered. I knew she was too young to have her own car. She must have handed the phone to Derek. He sounded high, almost shrill, as if he had lost something, his confidence. Dad? Derek, what's going on? Dad, we're so sorry. It was a mistake. We didn't know. Damn it, what? Didn't know what? Elaine again, Dad. I thought, damn, if she's calling me Daddy, she must be really serious. What's wrong, honey? Dad, just go to your laptop. Open your mom's messages. I was dumbfounded, and then I remembered. She connected my laptop to Barbara's phone, but also hers. I said, Wait a minute. I looked at Barbara. She cried quietly and did not look at me. Do you know anything about this? She groaned. No, I just know they're both really angry about something and blaming me. I picked up the phone again and said to Elaine, Where are you now? Dad. I said, Where are you? We're at my friend Cheryl's. Dad, you should look at Mom's messages. My stomach twisted into a knot. Not only was that woodland bastard harassing my wife, but his behavior was beginning to affect my children. I said, come home. I think I know what the problem is. Come home. I'll fix it. Elaine continued to cry. She said, no, you don't know dad. Come home, Elaine, and bring Derek with you. You can wait in the car if you don't want to go inside. Elaine sobbed, okay, dad. And then, Dad, I love you. I love you too, honey. 
Now come home. We'll fix everything. I closed the phone. I looked at my wife. Is someone harassing you at work? Who is Matthew Woodland? I swear I would never have believed it. They say they saw someone turn white as a sheet. I thought Barbara would faint for a moment. It was so quiet that we could have been in a mausoleum. I asked her, is he harassing you? Hard as a board, white as a sheet of paper, silent as death, Barbara answered so quietly that I could barely hear her. She said, no. I was furious, really furious. That woodland bastard not only harassed my wife, but he was fucking ruining my family's life, and he managed to intimidate my wife so much that she couldn't even tell me. I tried to calm down. I took a deep breath. Barbara, listen to me. I got a call last Friday. Someone told me about Hank Chenoweth's retirement. I went to Moore. You weren't there. I called your office and it was closed. I know. That you made up a story about work. Don't be afraid. There are laws about this. He harassed you, didn't he? She rubbed her hands, twisting them in all directions. Her eyes were wider than saucers. I began to fear for her health. I spoke as calmly and quietly as possible. Tell me, Barbara, we can handle this. I reached out to hold her hands. Tell me, honey. She pulled her hands away. No, Ryan. She sometimes called me Rye instead of Ryan. He didn't harass me. I was on the edge. I didn't know what to do. Should I have gone to his house and beaten him to a pulp or something different? Okay, this is not the moment when I stop and tell everyone that I was in the army, that I was a Navy SEAL, how I earned a silver star in Iraq or Afghanistan when I saved 20 of my comrades from an RPG attack. No, nothing like that. But here's the truth. I joined the Maryland National Guard right out of high school. I used the money they provided to help pay for college. I've never done anything. I was a clerk. I went through basic training but never did anything. But, this is a big but. While I was in the Guard, I smoked a little. Not much, but a little. One day one of the officers, who was a doctor in real life, grabbed my hand. I never made it past the E5 rank, by the way. He grabbed my hand and told me I had a problem. He said that I need to quit smoking, otherwise, he said I needed to see my family doctor. Well, that's what I did. I went to our family doctor. He looked at me and immediately diagnosed me. He said I had a disease called endarteritis obliterans. For those who don't know, it is also called Buerger's disease. He asked me if I remembered how dizzy I felt the first time I smoked. I said yes. He said it was because my capillaries were shrinking and squeezing out the oxygen. He said that over time they would remain closed and I would begin to lose body parts due to gangrene. He said, don't believe me, see for yourself. He stood up from his chair, walked around the table and pointed with his hand at my legs just above the groin. He said we might have to amputate them here eventually. Then he said, Ryan, you will walk or you will smoke but you won't be able to do both. I almost shit myself. He told me to quit smoking and do anything that would improve and restore my blood circulation. Well, that's what I did. I started running. I pulled out an old set of York dumbbells that I bought back in ninth grade. I started lifting weights. I trained day and night. I ran every day. If anyone wanted, they could smell the fear from my scales and clothes. Have I resorted to steroids, honey, or vitamins? No, I was just working. I worked like hell. Have I lost my legs? No, have I quit smoking? Yes, was I becoming physically stronger? Of course, yes. I definitely don't know how to fight. Never threw a fist in anger in my life. But now I was angry, and I was built like a brick wall. Without ripped abs, of course, but I had arms, biceps, shoulders, and fucking strength. If I said I could kick that motherfucker's ass, I could. Touch my wife, get into my family, damn it. I tried my best to remain calm. It's okay, Barbara. You can tell me. It's Ryan. You know me. Barbara looked as scared as I was angry. She whispered again. No, Rye. She sometimes called me that instead of Ryan, he didn't harass me. I needed to make her understand. I said, honey, it's okay. On Friday night, 
Elaine took your phone and used some app to connect her laptop and my laptop to it. We have all the texts you've sent that bastard since then, if necessary. We can take him to court. I know the law. I know your company's anti-harassment policy. Trust me, everything will be fine. She collapsed. She dropped her head in her hands on the table. No, Ryan, she said. He didn't molest me. I molested him. I was stunned. I heard it, but I couldn't believe it. No, I got up from the table and went to get my laptop. I turned it on, found the folder, opened it, and started reading. Everything was wrong. It couldn't be. There were only about 200 words, all in a day. They were like death. She was right. She was chasing him. He's not hers. He was not married. At least I didn't think so. I read some of these lines over and over again. Here they are. They were terrible. I love you, Matt. You make me young again. When can we meet again? I can leave this Sunday. I want you so much. You are my heart. You own my heart. Let's both take Monday off. I need you. I don't care. I'll do whatever you want. I'll leave my husband. I can't live without you. Here it is. Here it is in black and white. My wife, my family, my life, everything I worked for, everything I ever wanted, everything I ever valued was sitting there on the computer screen. Dead. I felt dead. I wanted to die. I knew my life was over. Then I heard a car pull up in front of the house. They were children. I closed the screen and folded the laptop. Carrying it, I quickly went out to the car. I arrived just as Derek and Elaine were leaving. I pushed Derek back into the car. Go back to Cheryl. Stay there until I call. Elaine looked at me. Oh, her face, her tear-stained face. She said, you read them, didn't you? I told her, just go back to Cheryl and wait for my call. She said, okay, Dad. They both returned to the car, but did not drive away. I yelled at them to leave, but Derek only moved 30 feet away. I thought, to hell with it. I turned and looked at the house. All I thought was, you're a bitch. You're a fucking cheater. You'll get exactly what you want. I returned to the house. Barbara was at the front door. Ryan, I. I walked past her. I think I pushed her too hard because she hit the door frame. I did not care. I quickly but calmly walked upstairs to our bedroom. Our bedroom had a retractable staircase leading up to the attic. Our suitcases were in the attic. I got up and threw off all the suitcases, hers and mine. I went back down. She stood at the bedroom door, Ryan. I didn't look. If I looked at her, I knew I would kill her. I went to her side of the closet and started pulling out her dresses, all those expensive dresses that she really wanted. I started throwing them first into one suitcase, then into another. She entered the room, Ryan and I. I didn't look up. I continued to load her things. I said, you're leaving. She came up and grabbed my hand. I've lost control. I didn't hurt her, but I lifted her onto the bed. You could start helping me pack my things. She stood up and just looked at me. I didn't wait. I filled all the suitcases, travel bags, and two cosmetic kits. When they were full, I went down and grabbed a box of trash bags. I was surprised. It didn't take long. I collected everything that belonged to her, down to the toothbrush, into some kind of container. I started taking it all out to her car. She followed me. Ryan, please. I said, you can help, you know. She said, please don't do this. She tried to stand in my way at the front door. I just pushed her away again. She slipped and fell again. I did not care. I felt like I could hit her. Soon I packed all her things into her BMW. I was surprised that everything fit. She continued to follow me, crying. She kept crying and begging, Ryan, please don't do this. Ryan, oh please, I'm sorry. I was a fool, Ryan, oh Ryan, darling. I thought, Ryan, honey, this is good. Finally, I collected all my things. I threw her my purse. It hit her right in the chest. I told her, get out of here and never, and I mean never come back. She was hysterical. 
The neighbors all came outside to watch. She screamed, Ryan, don't do this. Don't kick me out. I have nowhere to go. I stopped. Despite my anger, I smiled. Oh no, there is. You have Matthew. Go to your new lover. I carefully, and I must admit, despite my anger, carefully put her into the car. She still hit her head. I was about to slam the door when I saw the glitter of gold. I said, wait a minute. I got into the car, grabbed her left wrist, pulled her hand out, and took off first the tenth ring, then the engagement ring, and lastly the wedding ring. I took all three. By then it was almost dark. I leaned back and threw them as far into the night as I could. I looked at her. Now get out of here. She cried. I could tell she was panicking as she slowly drove away. One of our neighbors, a close friend, asked, Ryan, what are you doing? I looked at him and said, I'm getting ready to kill the next bastard who says a word to me. He raised his hands and stepped back. I turned and walked back into the house. I went to the kitchen, fell on a chair, put my head in my hands and cried. This was not the getting off the adrenaline high kind of crying. I cried because of what I had just done. I kicked my wife out of our house. I threw away almost 20 years of love. But then I stopped. I didn't throw anything away, it's her. I found my mobile phone and called the children. Now we can go back. The children were nearby. They returned and saw devastation. Derek came in and asked, I saw mom leaving. Where did she go? I said, to my lover. Derek didn't say anything, just went upstairs. Elaine looked at me and cried, Oh, Dad, haven't you talked to her? The way she said it reminded me of the little girl Zuzu from that old movie, It's a Wonderful Life. Yes, I thought, but there are no angels here to save this mess. The next morning I got the kids up. We talked a little. I made it clear to them that that woman would never enter that house again. Even if I have to burn this place down, she will never return. My kids were scared enough. I told them that if their mother called, they could talk to her. If they want to live with her, they can. I told them they were old enough to make this decision. I also told them that no matter what, I love them. I just can't be around their mother anymore, ever. They went to school, everyone in their own car. I called into work and took sick leave for the rest of the week. I knew what I had to do, and I took it much further. Of course, I closed the accounts. I blocked my credit cards. I went to the bank and changed all the accounts. I canceled Barbara's car and health insurance. I turned off her mobile phone. I made an appointment with a lawyer. I called a locksmith and asked him to change the locks. I've done all this and more. I wanted revenge. There is now no such thing as alienation of affection in Maryland. If I wanted to get money from that person, I wouldn't get anything. And I still wouldn't get it. What difference does it make to me? I was still in trouble. I called Barbara's company and set up a meeting with HR. They needed to know. They had a contract. I wouldn't call it a moral contract, but it meant the same thing. My dearest hope was that by the end of the week Matthew Woodland and Barbara Green would be looking for work. My attempts to ruin their careers didn't work out exactly as I planned, but I came close. I went to their HR department. I took the texts with me. That's all I needed. The head of the HR department was a man. He politely informed me that they would take care of Mr. Duris Woodland, but my wife had been working too long. He said she definitely couldn't stay in the public relations department. They should find something else for her. The rest took much longer. I saw a lawyer, and he explained a little about Maryland laws to me. If I tried to file for divorce, it would be painful and incredibly expensive. But there was an alternative in Maryland. In Maryland, there was what was called a separation agreement. The lawyer explained it this way. There was what he called limited divorce. Technically, we would still be married, but we would be living separately. There could be no sexual relations while we were apart. If after a year there is no resolution, the limited divorce will become what he called an absolute divorce. During this year, Barbara and I not only could not have a relationship with each other, but if we had a relationship with anyone else, it would be considered adultery. 
Yeah, if she touches her new boyfriend, she will commit adultery. Damn it, she already did it, but I'll catch her. I'll catch her in the act. I hated her. I hated her so much. Of course, there were questions about child support, possibly alimony, custody, health insurance, some property issues, but the most important thing was there would be a date. One year from the initial date and the present divorce will take effect. I asked the lawyer if one spouse could apply for this without the other's consent. He said yes, but the judge may require some kind of counseling. I thought about counseling screw counseling, but the lawyer told me that if the judge orders it, I will have to do it. This made me angry, but I decided that it would be a price to pay in the end. I gave him consent and left his office. I was in a daze. I was destroyed. Deep down, I still found it hard to believe what she had done. But it was there. It was all there. I was amazed at how she changed. I was also amazed at how much I had changed. In less than a week, I went from a loving husband willing to die for his wife to a man obsessed with hatred, a man consumed with revenge. Did I care? No, I was Shylock. I will have my pound of flesh, even if it means cutting out her worthless, traitorous heart. Hank Williams, your stealthy heart. Before this, I had only thought of this song as something fun to dance to. Now, well. A couple of weeks later, I heard from another friend at her company, an insider. They transferred Woodland to another location in another state. My friend thought they would let him work there until the fire died down, and then they would find a reason to fire him if he didn't quit. He said they had the same plan for Barbara. She was transferred from public relations to a department about which she knew almost nothing. This meant a reduction in wages. He believed that she would be fired within a year. Yes, I got my revenge. Nothing else worked. Derek was angry at both of us. He packed his things and moved in with a friend. He promised to keep me informed about school. I promised to make sure the tuition was paid when he finished. Elaine returned, but it was not a happy time. I could check her grades by looking online. When I saw that they were dumping, her reaction was lukewarm. I have a classic. Come on. I didn't know what to do. Barbara did indeed move in with Woodland. Damn, she had no other place. She stayed there for about a week before they told me she had found something for herself. I found out where it was. What a rat hole. Well, she saw it coming. I had a house and intended to stay. A lot of capital went into this. We lived there for over ten years and refinanced twice. We have never been affected by a housing collapse. Then we were proud of our wisdom. It didn't matter much now. If we couldn't reach an agreement, we probably would have sold it. I looked around. There were so many memories. Memories, that was another problem. I was surrounded by them. Everywhere I looked I saw reminders of our past life, another life, and now a dead one. There were photographs, but they were more than just pictures. Of course, the family portrait taken when Derek started high school, our wedding photo, Elaine in a tutu, they all mattered. I think the figurines under the plastic dome in the Chinese cabinet irritated me. No, they were still stupid things. The scratch on the kitchen counter after Barb cut herself. The scratches on the wood floor when we pulled in the piano that Barb just had to have. And the scratches when we pulled it back out after she quit classes. There was a photograph of the two of us on our 15th wedding anniversary. Her and I at the helm as we boarded a cruise ship. Oh my God. Photo from a barbecue from a year ago. Me holding a beer, hugging Barb, her secret, knowing smile. We just quickly slipped right under our neighbor's nose. Yes, oh yes, these were the things that hurt. I mean, it really hurts. How could she? My lawyer filed the forms for a separation agreement in Hagerstown in Washington County, but damn, I forgot it was Maryland. Maryland was a state where speed meant slow, slow meant tortoiseshell, and tortoiseshell meant inert. After seemingly pointless delays, my lawyer finally filed suit almost three weeks later, in October. The courts took time to come up with a schedule. We only set a date for November 19th, the Tuesday before Thanksgiving. Nothing mattered until we made a date. I thought, they don't tell people about this kind of nonsense in the newspapers. So, just before Thanksgiving, we found ourselves in the Hadgerstown Courthouse, a shithole of the 18th century, 
and the appointed judge had run off to God knows where. We had a replacement and didn't find out about it until we got there. My lawyer told me not to worry, it was just a formality. I sat at the table with my lawyer. Barbara sat at her desk with hers. We were scheduled for the morning, but everything was slow and tiring. We had to wait until late in the evening. Now sitting before us was a judge who looked older than Methuselah. He could have been Methuselah all the time he spent. As for Barbara, she looked great. I felt tired and exhausted, but she looked like she had just returned from vacation. Her hair was perfect, her makeup was flawless, her dress fit like a sleeve. She looked fresh, healthy, and young. I assumed that sex with a man just six years older than her son must be therapeutic. My lawyer leaned over and whispered, This is Judge Landy's. Things might get a little more complicated. They say that his granddaughter's ex-husband treated her quite rudely during the divorce. Just what I need, I thought, a grandfather full of righteous anger. The judge went through the documents slowly, painfully slowly. The clerk, a very young-looking woman, had to stand next to him while he slowly turned the eight pages. Finally, he glanced at us over his glasses. I could barely understand his garbled remarks. He looked at me. You will get your year. It starts today, he turned to the clerk and muttered. What day is it today? The clerk smiled softly and said, On the 19th. The old man smiled at the clerk. I saw him gently pat her hand. Thank you, dear. He looked at me again and frowned, then looked at Barbara and smiled. I see you have two children, a girl and a boy. I'm old enough to understand. I expect to see them just after Thursday, say Friday morning, at this place. He took a couple of pieces of paper and wrote down the address. He then added, I expect you two to be there too. My lawyer stood up. But your honor. The judge reached for his gavel, knocking off the glasses in the process. He hit the wooden resonator with a glancing blow. This is my son from the courtroom. Do not interrupt. My lawyer timidly sat back. Then my ex-wife's lawyer stood up, hopefully someday. The judge looked up. Yes? Barbara's lawyer stated politely, not obsequiously, Your Honor, my client respectfully requests a consultation. The judge smiled at my wife. He looked at me and frowned, then looked back at my wife. I see that this request for divorce is not your idea. He turned to me again and added in an unfriendly tone, Counseling will be held. My lawyer stood up again, with permission of the court. The judge looked down at my man. Yes. With the permission of the court, my lawyer added, we would like to participate in the selection of any lawyer. The judge, almost ignoring my lawyer, said, I will choose a lawyer, and then looked at me, whoever it is will treat both spouses fairly. I shrugged. I heard a whistle and felt the railroad tracks on the back of my head. The judge then closed the proceedings. I will see both children at the designated location on Friday morning. I expect both parents to be present. The presence of lawyers is not required. In the meantime, I will check the resources of this couple and make a decision. Will there be anything else now? My man said, No, Your Honor. Barbara's lawyer agreed, and that was it. Until Friday. As we left the courtroom, Barbara approached me. Should I bring the kids or do you want to? I had no idea. Did she get to them? I replied, well, Derek will stay with. She interrupted him. He is with me now. Damn, I thought he moved in with a friend. Now I find out that my son is dating a cheating bitch. Defector, I started saying something about Elaine. Well, I... Barbara interrupted me. I know Elaine is with you. Tell her I said hello and that I love her. I thought, this is seriously screwed up. I replied, so it's Friday morning. I saw the address. It was a private home on the outskirts of Hagerstown, the address. I didn't know it then, but we were in the private residence of the old judges, and my children, at least my son, had largely betrayed me. We all met at the judge's house. I think he could do it. We seem to have become, although I did not know or understand why, his project. 
Barbara and I were sitting outside in what I would call a small living room. There were only two antique Queen Anne-style chairs, a large sofa, and an old desk with a swivel chair in front of it. We both sat uncomfortably. I sat on the sofa and felt tired and uncomfortable. Barbara was sitting in one of the chairs, reading a novel. She looked great. We sat there for almost two hours. No water, no way to go to the toilet, nothing. The children went into a closed adjacent room and sat with the judge. I could barely hear their conversation. From time to time I heard laughter. I couldn't understand the content of the discussion. Just before noon the judge and my children came out. Derek shook the judge's hand, kissed his mother, but only nodded in my direction. Elaine kissed the judge on the cheek. She thanked him. I didn't know why. She kissed her mother and, standing aside, politely said that she would wait for me. I thought, thanks for nothing. The judge smiled at Barbara and said, I'd like to see you tomorrow, say 9 o's in a.m. if you can. Barbara smiled sweetly and said she could. She really knew how to charm. He looked at me. I would like to talk to you now. Can you do that? What options did I have? I said yes. He took me back to the room where he was with my children. We both sat down in another one of those old chairs. He offered me a glass of water. I took it. Then he began. Mr. Cursey Green, I have read your lawyer's papers and spoken with your children. Your wife's behavior is, of course, almost inexcusable. To have an affair with another man, in this case a much younger man, is a cruel betrayal of your trust. It says here that you married for quite a long time. 18 years to be exact. You met in college, and you wrote about how much you loved her. I know that must hurt terribly. I started talking. For the first time I thought he sympathized with me. Your honor, I would like. He raised his hand. Save your honor for the courtroom. Here I'm just Alan. I wanted to continue. I started to speak again, but he stopped me again. No, now it's my turn. You'll have your chance in a minute, okay? I said, yes, sir, Alan. He smiled, he really smiled. Perhaps a glass of brandy. I said, no, I'm fine. Okay, he said, let's see what happened. First, your wife broke her vows. She left the nest and started an affair with a much younger man. I sent it to my secretary on Tuesday of this week. I received some photos. I would say that he is very attractive, handsome, as my secretary said. Yes, a real ladies' man. My stomach churned. The judge continued, You certainly loved her, or loved her deeply. Her betrayal, any betrayal like this, is the worst thing that can happen to a happily married man, and you were very happily married. I answered hoarsely, Yes, I was. But then what happened? You discovered what she had done and you reacted, or should I say you overreacted? I started to say something, but he stopped me again. I have it all written down here, Mr. Cray, Green, Ryan. You literally physically threw her out of your house. Your children were there. You remember, don't you? You pushed her away. They saw it. They said that you knocked her down. Mr. Carl Green, that's not how grown men, grown men with children act towards the one they loved. Mr. Green Ryan, you were pretty merciless that night, weren't you? I answered as best I could. Judge, I mean Alan, you don't understand. I trusted her. I thought that he, this man, this handsome guy, was after her. I found out that she was after him. She was mine. Wife, I read her messages. She wanted to leave me and go to him. Your honor, Alan, it's just unfair. He interrupted. Ryan, I know. I have your comments. You were quite, how shall I say, graphic in your descriptions. Your feelings, you said yourself, your emotions were out of control. Your son said he thought that you threatened the neighbor, an old friend, Ryan, do you understand that you could have been arrested? I wilted. Okay, I went a little overboard, but wouldn't you? He leaned back. I don't know, Ryan. I honestly don't know. But I do know one thing. Your wife has a right to something here. Did you give her your word for once? Did she say anything? Just once? I felt depressed, destroyed. No, I thought. Ryan, 18 years, two children, 
twenty years of devotion, and not a single word. I was backed into a corner. No, I guess. I mean, yeah, I guess. He smiled. So you'll let her tell her story. I don't think it'll do much good, but who knows? At least you'll get some closure. I started thinking my father. I'm talking to my father. I replied, I don't think it can hurt. I added, it won't change anything. The old judge folded his hands. Okay, let's look at the financial side. Oh no, I thought, this is where I'm going to get torn to pieces. Yes, I said. He looked at some papers in his lap. Before her transfer, your wife made the same amount as you. And yes, we know why she lost her management position. The reason doesn't matter, but now she makes a lot less. I saw her new place. It's very different from the house you bought with her. I think you're still living there. Yes, sir, I am, I replied. My thoughts raced away. I was going to lose my home. They learn about this at work. I will be humiliated. The judge began to lecture me. Not to punish you, but if your wife stays there, she will need your help. It is your responsibility to arrange something for her. I see you've removed it from your health insurance. Her insurance is more expensive and the coverage is less. There are other costs as well. You removed it from your car insurance. Companies will find out. They will try to put her on a high-risk policy. You removed it from your credit cards. You could ruin her credit rating. Credit companies can give her a real holiday. Do you see what you've done? Ryan, she's still technically your wife. She is the mother of your children. You have rushed into things that will harm you, her, and your children. He continued, Son, I know you're hurting. People at your job will talk. You'll be called a cuckold. The evening's rage when you kicked her out will also be known. You might be called a violent person. If she lets her lawyer loose, I know him, he will be merciless. He did not let her go. Think about her too. You loved her once, you loved her for twenty years. She was demoted. She is a beautiful woman. You know how women feel about it. She will be humiliated every day she comes to work. She will be called an accessible whore. What about your children? Her shame and adultery will hurt them, but so will your revenge. All the values you tried to instill in her will be called into question. They're suffering, Ryan, and you're both to blame. Now about the money, I'm afraid you'll have to help with this, perhaps before the end of the year. I asked, how much? He handed me a paper with some numbers. I stared at the paper in bewilderment. I can't do this. I'll have to sell the house. Judge, this is the only house Elaine knows. I don't think Derek remembers. No, sir, I can't do this. He took the paper back. There is another way. Desperate, I asked. Which one? You have a spare room in your house. Elaine says it's a small office. I started shaking my head. He continued to say, Elaine has offered to give her room to your estranged wife. You both can still be legally separated as long as you agree to avoid any intimate contact. I kept shaking my head from side to side. He continued, I could have you evicted until Elaine turns 18. Ryan, a mother, always gets first priority when it comes to children. I don't want to do that to you. Barbara doesn't have to stay with you all year just long enough to get your finances in order. It could take a few months, maybe just a few weeks. I felt the blow coming. I don't. Mr. Gwurst Green, these are your children, your future. You can't tell me that you couldn't at least be polite to your wife for a few weeks. We'll be in counseling. Who knows? I'm not suggesting reconciliation, but you and your separated wife, you will be near each other as long as you live. Your children have the right to some of this, don't they? I slammed my hands on my knees. I need to use the restroom. Judge Landis pointed to the next door. I apologized. I went to the toilet and looked in the mirror. How could she look so good and I look so bad? Why am I making all the sacrifices when she is the one who ruined everything? It is not my fault. It's not fair. But I knew I had lost. I walked back to where Judge Landis was waiting. I'm not promising anything but I think if she stays away. He neither smiled nor frowned. I'll talk to Barbara. Maybe then all three of us can get together again. He stood up and extended his hand. 
Ryan, these things happen. You'd be surprised. Sometimes they work. I'm not suggesting a return to the fact that it is clearly irretrievably lost, but some army is not beyond the realm of possibility. One day, your children may get married. Someday you and Barbara will have to at least pretend to be friends. I wanted to cry, just cry, but I knew that he was right and wrong about friendship, of course. I didn't know where this would lead. I hoped Barbara would refuse to come back, but I wanted to keep the house. Even if I had only kept it for a couple more years, long enough for Elaine to graduate from high school and go to college, I needed this house. This all seemed less likely since Elaine had already fallen off in her studies. Late Thursday evening, a week before Thanksgiving, I received a call from Judge Landy's office. Barbara wanted to return, but she agreed to take the small office room. Elaine could keep her room. We have set a moving date for this Sunday. Sunday has arrived. I hired some movers, and four hours later Barbara was where it all began. The children were delighted. Barbara seemed cautious. I was miserable. I left. I spent the whole day outside the house. I ate at the restaurant and didn't return until it was time to go to bed. While I was gone, Barbara and Elaine cleaned the entire house from top to bottom. Derek took Barbara's car and washed it. He stopped at the station we usually used, it was closed, but he said he left a note. He wanted her to be examined. Derek said it was an old Chevrolet Cavalier that was in pretty bad shape. Elaine and Derek worked out a system where they shared their rides to school so their mother could use one of their cars to commute to work. Our new living conditions brought changes that I did not foresee. With the exception of Barbara's small room, I could still move around the house freely, but everything else was different. Barbara brought all her clothes, so Derek gave away all his closets and moved his things downstairs. We had a simple bathroom in the basement, toilet, small sink and shower. Derek started using this bathroom. The old office didn't have a bathroom, but Elaine's room had a full bath. Barbara and Elaine shared it. I still had the master bedroom, our old king bed, a full bath with a shower and a jacuzzi tub. The master bedroom had a huge double closet. Before the breakup, Barb's clothes took up most of the space. I offered to share, but no one accepted the offer, so I had a huge closet that was almost empty, while things were stacked everywhere. The downstairs was set up so that I could use the living room, dining room, kitchen and laundry room whenever I wanted. Barbara and the kids said they would only use the kitchen when I was at work or in bed. They told me that if I wanted to use the kitchen they would leave immediately. I could use the living room and TV whenever I wanted. Elaine had a TV, so they decided they would watch everything there. I could go there if I needed to, but they stayed away everywhere. I had the whole house almost to myself. That first week, when I walked into the room, they all just disappeared. Barbara was literally jumping to get out of my way. Sometimes it seemed to me that she was hiding from me. One day I went to the kitchen to get some soda. I heard her and found her standing in the back of our pantry. I went to the door and asked her, Why are you hiding here? She ran out with an apology, Sorry. Damn it. She acted as if she was afraid of me. Of course I hated her. I hated what she did. She broke my heart and ruined everything, but I would never hit her. I think this was intentional. Barb played the role of a martyr. It just wasn't right. By the end of the first week, I was miserable. I had a home, but I felt like an outcast. Wherever I went, they went. If I was somewhere, they stayed away. I saw a movie where a guy died and came back as a ghost. He saw everyone. He tried to talk to them, but they acted as if he was not there. That's how I felt. If things hadn't changed, I would have left. I didn't want to do this. I had the same right to be in my home as everyone else, but they deliberately isolated me. As time passed, I felt a growing sense of alienation. This was wrong. It wasn't fair. I was the father. I did everything a father should do. I was the main breadwinner. I set disciplinary standards. Barbara was a friend. I taught them how to ride bicycles, how to skate, how to drive a car. In winter, I was the one who cleaned the path. All Barb ever did was make brownies and cocoa. I remembered cocoa and brownies because of what happened. 
One evening I walked into the kitchen and they were sitting at the table with, yes, brownies and cocoa that Barb had just made. Before I went in I heard them laughing and talking. It sounded like before. I walked in and they got up and left. Elaine wrapped the brownies and put them in the refrigerator. The three of them silently took their cups of cocoa and went upstairs. They left me without saying a word. I just stood alone in the kitchen. Elaine or Derek could suggest. Now that we were separated, living separately but in the same house, I felt like I had to beg for acceptance from the people who should be seeking my approval. My children avoided and ignored me and it hurt. That day has finally arrived. Barbara, the judge, and I met twice. Three more meetings were planned. I listened to Barbara's apology over and over again. I heard her tell me and the judge over and over again how she made a mistake, how her actions were regrettable, and how if she had the chance to do it over, she wouldn't do it. I'm tired of hearing her regrets. I was sorry too. She played on the feelings of the judge and mine by constantly crying. I was constantly asked to be patient. It was tiring. The sessions were supposed to be confidential, but someone was talking, and it wasn't me. My children took sides. Okay, I told them they could do whatever they wanted, but I knew Barbara was telling them her side of our meetings. I didn't mean to get into this. To make matters worse, I have two sisters. I know they took Barbara's side. They knew the details of my anger that night when I kicked Barbara out, but their understanding of what she had done to me and our family was distorted. I was surrounded. I knew what the judge wanted. He wanted reconciliation. I thought it was possible. Very distant, far, far away, once upon a time, perhaps in another life. Somehow I let them convince me to put reconciliation back on the table, but I wanted answers. Why did she run the way she did? Did I do something wrong? Have I failed? Was I indifferent to her wants and desires? Was I a bad lover? Was I insensitive? I just didn't know. If I failed, what did she see in this boy that she didn't see in me? Why was she so ready to give up everything we had, everything we had built? Sometimes I felt like Barbara was being trained by a judge. I mean, it was all too contrived. I was close to the edge. I didn't see any purpose in the counseling sessions. At home I felt like I was being pushed out. At work everyone looked at me with pity. In my free time, I started looking for an apartment. I mean, what's the point? And then one morning it happened. This was our third of five planned counseling sessions. The dam just broke and I got my answers. I was so upset. I stated everything as if for the hundredth time. I said, no more crap. Barb, tell me. Speak up. Why him? What was that? I was completely amazed. She finally decided to open up. I saw the judge trying to stop her. He said, Barbara, take your time. Ryan's not ready. Barb said, I can't keep this in anymore. He needs to hear. I saw the judge just shake his head. Barb opened up. Ryan, she said, Matt was different. He was young. He was excited. He was unpredictable. One time, instead of just going to bed, he threw me on it. He picked me up and threw me on the bed. It was so terribly exciting. As soon as she started, it was like a tsunami. We did it in the shower at his apartment. Do you remember I told you I was going to a seminar in August? I lied. It was a fake seminar. We ran away and rented a cottage. I mean, every time we were together, it was like an adventure. She actually stuck the knife in. She was good at it. He made me feel young and sexy. He constantly told me how beautiful I was. He loved my hair. He hugged me and kissed me and touched me all the time. He told me I was irresistible. He wasn't better. I mean, not physically, not in that sense, but he was so brave, so carefree. He held my hand wherever we went. He made me feel alive. One day he just took the cream and rubbed it all over my body. I couldn't help myself. He saw where your appendix was cut out. Do you remember that? I remember. I think your hero was about six years old then. She didn't listen. She continued, Oh, I love you, Ryan, but you've become so uninteresting, so boring. I thought, boring? Well, I guess so. After 20 years, things get pretty predictable. 
she was killing me. You're so normal, so reliable. You took care of me, you took care of things, but it was always the same. I always knew when you wanted a romantic evening, because you always, I mean always, came with flowers or perfume or chocolates. Sometimes I felt that the gifts were an advance payment for sex. Every Valentine's Day was the same. Oh, Ryan, I loved that about you. But Matt was so wild and free and unrestrained. You were stable. You protected me. I felt safe. You managed the budget. You were watching the cars. You took care of the house. Everything was so orderly. Oh, I loved all that about you, but Matt was so unrestricted. He didn't undress me. He tore my clothes. Then she struck the final blow. She opened my heart, and I watched as twenty years of love spilled onto the floor. Ryan, she said, you were easy. You were easy to please, easy to deceive. You believed everything I said. I could tell you anything, and you would believe me. Oh God, Ryan, right up until the end, right up until the moment you actually saw and read my messages, you believed that Matt was stalking me, it didn't even occur to you, that I could cheat on you. I couldn't do anything bad for you. You were so easy to deceive. I lied to you. You didn't even suspect that I could do whatever I wanted. Then, as if I was already dead, she had to finish it again. And when you found out, when you realized that I was the one who was after Matt, you changed, you changed right before my eyes. I honestly thought you could handle it. I was sure you could handle it. I thought if I was caught, you would sit down at a computer or a calculator or a piece of paper or something. You would find a solution. You were so methodical. I knew you, I knew what you would do, or so I thought. But you failed. You didn't do what I expected. Ryan, whom I knew for twenty years, went crazy. I never expected this. I never saw this. You became wild. You scared me. You became different. You suddenly became dangerous. Not excitingly dangerous like Matt, but frighteningly dangerous. I couldn't trust you anymore. I felt her knock me down, beat me to a pulp, and to finish me off, she dragged my face along the concrete path. I was crushed. I had no answer. I managed to squeeze out. You couldn't trust me? Was I methodical? Would I have handled your betrayal like some kind of equation? All I was to you was a mathematical formula, a machine, some kind of computer. I realized that she never knew me. At this point, the judge intervened. He said, I'm sorry I let you get that far, Barbara. Ryan, I'm sorry she said all those things. Barbara then looked at the judge. I'm sorry too. I just wanted Ryan to know how reliable he was, how much I counted on him. How, despite everything with Matt, I could always count on Ryan. That's when the judge finally took my side. He knew what I knew. The damage she had done was irreparable. Barbara, he said, for twenty years Ryan was there. He was your rock. He was there for love. Flowers, candy, perfume, these are not bribes for sex. There were gifts. These were his gifts of love. I listened, Barbara. We have been doing this for quite a long time. I have never heard you say anything to your husband. That you love him, not once during our entire conversation, not once in front of me. Barbara replied, but I love him. I love everything about him. Judge Landis disappeared, and a man named Alan appeared. He finally buried what was left. Do you really love? Have you ever, really? It was the end for me. I stood up and said, This is it for me. Judge, this is the end. I know we have two more sessions, and I will come, but after this, I'm sorry. Barbara started crying. Again. I continued. I felt dead, but a little alive, too. Barb. You know what I always wanted to be. She looked. All I saw was confusion. I told her, I wanted to be a cowboy. When I was a kid, Pancho and Lefty was my favorite song. Then Toby Keith came out with Should Have Been a Cowboy. I was in high school. I even bought a guitar, got pretty good. I think it's still in the attic somewhere. Do you even remember that I played the guitar? I needed to say it, not so much to Barbara, but to myself. Barbara, I had a friend who left Maryland and moved to Australia. I never saw him again or heard from him. I wanted to leave too. I felt like only 18. 
I enlisted in the National Guard. My father said, enlist, do the right thing. I had to go to college, so I went to college. I got a degree in accounting. We got married. We had two kids. We bought a house. I did everything everyone said I should do. Barbara cried so hard. I don't think she heard me, but then I had to go on. Look at me. I became the normal, normal guy that everyone wanted me to be. I did everything that was expected of me. I played the game. Rules. I've always been a good guy. What did you do? You went and slept with a guy. She stopped. She was sobbing, but I wasn't sure she heard me. I told her my hidden thoughts. I'm sorry, Barb. I'm sorry I wasn't enough for you. But honestly, when I look back, I wasn't enough for myself either. I actually stopped talking to Barbara. It was for me. I'm about to be 40. I spent the first 20 years growing up. The last 20 I did everything everyone told me I should do. That probably included flowers and candy and regular sex. This is the end. I'm not 40 yet. I missed a lot. I'm sorry that you realized that I was not enough. She was out of breath. Through tears she began, Ryan I. I didn't let her. This no longer concerned her. No, Barbara. When this is over and our year has passed, I will start again. I will leave the company. My children don't need me. You don't need me anyway. You need to be wild and free. Sorry, I, I don't know where I'll go or what I'll do, but it definitely won't be that anymore. I turned and looked at Judge Landy's. Judge, I want to go through the last two sessions. I'll hold out until next November, then I'll leave. I concluded, Barb, I love you. I will always love you. What's not to love you're perfect. But I don't want to be perfect anymore. I don't know what I want. I know I want something else. Who knows what the future will bring. I'm keeping everything, and I mean everything, my options open. I'm telling you, after next November, if I never see you or Derek or Elaine again, it will be okay because I know I did everything possible. The next stop for this train is for me. I owe it to you. I will love you forever for this. She cried like a child. I stood up. Judge, I'm leaving. And I left. I couldn't make it until November. I finished the last sessions. Around Easter, I went to see the judge. We sorted something out. I closed my retirement account and quit my job. The judge allowed me to cash out one of our smaller deposits and I left. I never told Barbara or the kids. I just packed my suitcase, called a taxi and disappeared. My wedding ring. I was supposed to open the pool at the end of May. It was one of my jobs. The morning I left, I went out into the yard, lifted the pool cover and threw the ring into the water. Maybe they'll find him, maybe they won't. Heck. I thought that now that I wasn't there to open the pool, they probably wouldn't even bother doing it. When I threw Barbara's ring, I was aiming for the neighbor's yard. Now I remembered how he mows the grass high. I thought that by June her rings would be buried deep in the ground. How symbolic this is. Where was I going to go? Well, I was too old to be a cowboy. But I always loved fishing and swimming, and although my fingers were no longer as dexterous, I could still play the guitar a little. Where could a person like me go? I went to Key West, Florida, the last place anyone would look for someone like me. I started growing my hair. I grew a big mustache. No beards, though. I remembered my dad's words about Woody Hayes and quick blowjobs. I got a job at a bar. At first, they forced me to work for free, but I was reliable, and they started paying me. I played guitar at night, although not very well but most people were too drunk or high to notice. I had three pairs of pants, a pair of brown jeans, a pair of blue jeans, and a pair of beige jeans. Okay, I also had shorts. I wore flip-flops and sneakers. I vowed to never wear a button-down shirt, sport coat, or tie again. I stuck to ripped t-shirts and enjoyed it. Oh, from time to time, I thought about the children and Barbara. I'll miss them too but I'd take a few shots and those thoughts would go away. I learned that there were other women. For an old man, I've become quite popular. I made new friends. I made friends. Some of my most beautiful friends were not girls. I didn't do that with them, but they accepted me and I felt good. I tried diving. 
I went fishing. I helped out on some of the piers. Some men who had boats allowed me to participate from time to time. I was good with numbers and helped some of them with taxes. I continued to live my life. It was another Monday when my life became confusing again. I corresponded with my sisters. I never used Skype and never told them where I was, or so I thought. I thought I was incognito. From time to time they gave me some news. I never asked. They told it themselves. I learned that, according to my lawyer and friends, Barbara's company found cause and fired her after about a year. The children were in and out of school. Well, that was their problem. That's when something stupid happened. I think someone figured something out. One afternoon I was wiping down the bar and a woman approached me. Brown hair, blue eyes, snow white teeth. She said, will you buy the girl a drink? It was Barbara. Somehow she found me. She said she hired a private investigator. I didn't believe it, but I didn't argue. Well, I prepaid for a small cottage on the cheap. Barbara started following me around. She found out where I live. Barbara continued to come to the bar. Some of the drunks. Well, she was beautiful. And then me. After a while, other men stopped pestering her. She kept appearing in places where I went at night. I was playing chess in one of the taverns late in the evening. She was always there, touching and kissing me. She looked and acted like the girl I met many years ago, only now she was even more beautiful and attentive. I knew what she was doing and I let her. I don't know why, but I was secretly delighted. I played calmly. We weren't married and I planned to stay that way. She moved. We started playing house again. Here's a funny thing that happened. One evening, we were out of the house. I got a little drunk. When we got home, I wanted to pick her up and throw her on the bed, just like she said that boy did. She burst into tears and started screaming, No, no, I want you, not this. So I put her in her place, and we made our old-fashioned kind of love. What can I say? I've always loved her. I learned that she also wanted different things. She stopped wearing makeup. She wanted to do something she had dreamed about. She took up pottery. I'll say this, the girl didn't have an iota of talent, not one iota. Still, she kept trying. She found a nice woman who owned a gift shop. Barbara persuaded her to put her trinkets on consignment. Of course, no one bought this crap. Well, you know me. Some people never change. Barbara walked back and forth to the old lady. Did anyone buy anything? So what did I do? I earned tips. Nobody knew how much. I started convincing tourists to buy her useless crap. She was listing the pot for $1.1995. I talked the tourist into buying it by giving him the cost of the pot plus another twenty as an after purchase. Barbara returned home all delighted. Look, paradise, someone bought one of my things. I'd say something like, great, Barbara. I knew it would happen. Now I buy these things regularly. I took them, put them in a bag, and threw them away. I don't think she'll ever find out. I think this shows that some people never change. Hard to believe. I still cared about her. And God, I was so damn happy. The end. Probably. Subscribe to our channel so that your love doesn't cheat on you, and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think, click to the next one.